organizers for putting together this amazing meeting and for inviting me. I'm really happy to, to be here and really excited to, to meet and discuss with people at the meeting. Um, so to sort of position the interests of my lab uh, as an introduction, uh, us, like most everybody in the room, is interested in, in figuring out how the brain works, how it generates sensory perception, motor control, cognition, and then perhaps uh, try and understand how neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disease may cripple uh, brain function. Now, we tackle these questions at the level of neural circuits, because neural circuits are sort of the basic computational units uh, the brain uses. So for example, here, uh, motor neurons in the spinal cord are essential components of the sensory motor circuit that, that controls the movement of our limbs. Now, I'm particularly fascinated in the, in the diversity of the different types of neurons that constitute such neural circuits. Um, this is evident at the cellular molecular level. So for here, example, for, uh, again, motor neurons, but now distinct types of motor neurons labeled by distinct types of or distinct patterns of gene expression. This diversity of cell types is, is very obvious at the morphological level. It's obvious at the, or it's very prominent at the level of local long range connectivity and perhaps most importantly at the level of, of functional and intrinsic properties. And I would argue that understanding uh, neural diversity is one of the key challenges in trying to understand neural circuit function. So we, we chose the olfactory cortex, the piriform cortex, as our model system for the following reasons. So first, as you've heard throughout the meeting, olfaction is of outstanding ecological importance. Animals, mice, really care about what they smell. And, um, and this tight link allows us to, to establish causal relationships between circuit function and behavior. Uh, olfactory cortex is a sophisticated thing, so it integrates um, segregated input channels from the olfactory bulb to create other objects or other perception. It also links uh, other perception to experience and learning and memory, so it plays essential functions in, in associative olfactory learning and memory. Now, both in humans and in mouse models, the olfactory system is tightly linked to social and emotional behaviors, aging and neurodegenerative disease. So there's a considerable interest in understanding olfactory circuit function from a tr translational perspective. However, for us, the most important reason we study olfactory cortex is because it's a comparatively simple cortical circuit. And I'll, I'll go into that in, in a minute. Um, as has been pointed out throughout the meeting, the, the odorants are detected in the olfactory epithelium by odorant receptors expressed on olfactory sensory neurons. These neurons project to the olfactory bulb, and uh, neurons expressing the same receptor can coalesce into individual glomeruli in the olfactory bulb, such that odors elicit these discrete segregated patterns of glomerular activity. Now, what I would like to point out or stress is that in order for us to, to perceive odors, to generate these other objects we can describe and that animals can report to us in terms of behavior, uh, this segregated information has to be integrated, and this integration happens in olfactory cortex. So how, do, how is information transmitted from the bulb to the cortex? Mitchell and Tufted says, as, as Florin explained uh, very nicely in the previous talk, project to large areas in the brain. Uh, this is very from cortex here. And in contrast to this segregated, tight organization of projections to the olfactory bulb, these, these projections are widespread and diffuse, and, and as such allow for the integration of different glomerular input channels. And consistent with this anatomy, both imaging data and electrophysiology have, have shown quite clearly that, that orders activate these very distributed uh, patterns of neural activity in piriform cortex. Now, so olfactory cortex is close to the periphery, as, as also Charlie introduced, is only two synapses away from the, from the uh, sensory neuron. And it's also a relatively simple in organization. So olfactory cortex sits here at the bottom of the brain. This is the coronal section through the mouse brain. Uh, below and the, the neocortex here is composed of three layers. Uh, layer one containing the, the main input uh, axons from micro and tufted cells, synapse onto dendrites of principal cells in layers two and three, which then form a large recurrent network and also um, 
accommodate associative uh, top-down inputs from other cortical and subcortical areas. However, how these uh, circuit functions emerge from the concerted activity of different types of neurons in piriform cortex is poorly understood, and that's what I will uh, try to address a little bit in, during my talk. So I'll, I'll be discussing two sets of experiments. First, uh, a set of, of calcium imaging experiments, which, which allowed us to better understand how information about odors is encoded in olfactory neural circuits in, in the cortex. Uh, this, these data also highlight sort of the functional diversity of different uh, neurons in cortex. A second set of experiments where we used molecular genetics to identify uh, markers, molecular signatures that identify, delineate different types of neurons and, and their connectivity patterns. And then I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time to, to illustrate where we're taking these experiments next. So to explore, uh, and this is uh, following up nicely on, 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 on Florian's talk with, with a lot of sort of overlapping interests and, and techniques. So to explore um, sensory processing in olfactory cortex, we use two photon imaging. So we stereotoxically inject the calcium indicator 6, uh, GCAMP 6, into piriform cortex. The experiments I'll describe are uh, performed in anesthetized animals, which, which is a big caveat on, on one hand. On the other hand, we have now, um, both with Kevin Frank's electrophysiology in awake and anesthetized animals and preliminary uh, new data, imaging data in awake animals, which, which really demonstrate that the kinds of parameters we use for the analysis I'll describe are fairly conserved across, across brain states, and, and we're fairly confident that they're generally uh, relevant. But and I'll be happy to discuss that later. So this is what it looks like uh, when we infect piriform neurons. These are all the responses which you may have seen, so color-coded uh, from blue to red. Uh, these are very densely labeled areas, so we had to develop an algorithm to, to actually uh, automate and uh, to, to, to segment these cells in an automated fashion. So this algorithm uses correlation over time like many other algorithms, but also um, takes into account uh, spatial constraints and, and much is much uh, works very well in particular for such um, densely labeled areas in the brain. And, and these are just, um, the next slide are just some example responses of such, such uh, experiments. So these are uh, 12 different neurons, I believe, in lines, and, and 13 different order stimuli. And, and there's basically two things we observe. First of all, um, these, um, the response, uh, properties we observe are very diverse. So, so we see neurons that, that respond with an increase in activity indicated in red, with a decrease in activity indicated in blue. There's neurons that, that are very uh, broadly tuned that will respond to pretty much every order you give them. There's neurons that are very selective for particular neurons. There's neurons that are very um, reproducibly respond across different trials, others that show a lot of trial-to-trial -trial variability, etc. And, um, and, and, and so, so we can map these responses now back onto the imaging site, and that's, that's shown here. And we see these um, dispersed um, order responses that are consistent with previously published data. Now, what's different here with this increased resolution, both temporal and, um, and, and spatial or, or, or higher uh, signal or noise, is that we can use single trial uh, instead of averaging. And that sort of highlights two important features of these uh, responses. One is that there's a lot of trial-to-trial -trial variability. So you see, for example, these neurons here responding to acetate. On trial number one, they respond again. One disappears. The other one is active. The other one comes back. One disappears, etc. So across trials, about 50, 60 percent of neurons kind of come, come and go, and, uh, and and there's a lot of variability that way. Right, right. So very. So we did these experiments. It's very low. We see about 10 to 15 percent active neurons, and spontaneous activity is in the range of one to one to three percent. So the, over the same, yeah. If we do the same types of windows, the other aspect is that a lot of neurons show very, very overlapping response properties. So you see that these, this, 
true neurons here respond happily to all three orders without much of a preference. And if you go through these patterns, you find a lot of them. So what that tells you is that looking at individual neurons really doesn't tell you anything about the stimulus information. And so we have to reformat these data uh, in such ways that we can quantitatively um, get at understanding uh, what they may represent. So this is such a, a matrix or a vector where, where the cells of a particular imaging site, about 280, 300 cells, are, are lined up on, on the y-axis. There's 13 different orders and four trials each, so that e each data point represents the response uh, average change in fluorescence over a short period of time after stimulus. And with these um, matrices, we can now begin to quantitatively compare and, 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 and uh, uh, calculate similarities and differences in the response patterns to different orders. So in such a simple way by, by calculating the correlations. And uh, what you see here is that so, so correlation, I mean, similarities between one and the same stimulus per definition one is on, on, on the diagonal here. And, and this makes two points, really, that so four trials of hexanol, for example, are fairly correlated to each other and different from other odorants. That's true for some, but if you, for example, look up here at citronol, then you see that there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity or sort of dissimilarity between different uh, citronol trials, and the similarity is fairly um, equal across the, the different sets of orders, which, which reflects this sort of overlapping and trial to trial variability. Yes. So the orders are, are pseudo randomized such that we never use the same order twice in a row and the intertrial intervals are two, two minutes. We've done this with, with uh, longer intertrial intervals, etc. And, and I think we're fairly confident that none of that reflects habituation and things like that. Four in this case, four, four to seven. So about 60, 50 to 60 percent of neurons will respond on consecutive trials. And the other half of neurons kind of come in and out. And So, no, come, yes, well, it's about the same. Half of the neurons will respond. Will respond all four times. No, will yeah. respond in consecutive trials. And, and then they come back at some point later, and we haven't done that in, in, in extensive enough um, uh, manner such that we can, you know, ask how, what's the percentage of neurons total that would respond to a particular order, and I cannot tell you that. But some of them will never Oh, yes, absolutely. Right. 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 Yes. I, I, I'll have to think if there's some logic to that. I, 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 of, I, of the, I can remember that. All cells that have been imaged in this case. Okay, but so to, to more directly ask if these patterns are different such that they can be discriminated, we use the classifiers similar to what, what had been discussed before. And, and this is now based on, again, a single uh, imaging site and, and works pretty well. So using a, a linear classifier, we can predict uh, based on single trial response patterns with an accuracy of above 70% the identity of an order within this order set of 13 different orders. And if we combine our windows either within the mouse or across mice, then we can very quickly reach uh, accuracies that, that go beyond 80, 90%, which is consistent with, with, a, with the physiology data. So what? So what which layer in piriform cortex? So we've, we've done, we've played a lot with layers. Um, I'll come to that, I'll come back to that later. In, from my perspective, it's not always flat, and so guessing as to where you are within a layer is not a good reference, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So, um, so, so basically this tells us that 
that in the, the, the response patterns we image contain sufficient information to, to predict the identity of an order. We can then ask how is this information distributed uh, across piriform cortex? Is it organized, is it clustered, or is it distributed as, as previously suggested? So these are 250. This is one imaging site, well, on average 220, you can remember. The, if, you, if you generate pseudo-populations by, by adding uh, imaging sites, then, then that's what you get. So we need about 200, 150 to 300 neurons to, to uh, come to an accuracy of above 70%, which is reasonable. The green is fluorescence, in fact, because so we're using very slow ways of dealing with that, and, and, this is, and, and there's a delay in classification which is entirely explained by the delay in fluorescence we measure. 13. 13. It's the same order set that, it's that order set, it's 13 orders, and so the, the chance level is, is here, 7%. So the number is 0. 0.6 on average. Yeah. 0. 0.6 correlation yes. on average with it from one trial Right. And across this order set, right. the number is 0. 0.45. Right. So. Oh, oh, I see. The linear classifier results are a different order set. No, no, that's the same. That's the same order set using a linear classifier, but just looking at correlations. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and your success in, in in identifying it, how well on an order by order basis that correlates. That I don't think we've. Okay. I don't think we've. These are Pearson correlation people. Yeah. But we've done, you know, basically they tell you that there's some consistency and some noise. We, we didn't really look into that. So, so maybe last quick question. I, yes. Yes. Yes, and again, we've done several ways of classifying, and it, it basically comes out in a very similar way. This is Euclidean distance. So people must have done this with microscopes, right? Yes. Is this different from microcells? So I'll, I'll come, maybe I'll come back to that okay. in a minute. Yes, we, in fact, we've done it with microcells, and I'll show you the, the results. Okay, so we're looking at how this information is organized in space, and, and we did the following experiment. So, so if, if information is clustered, okay, so, so we, we, we calculated the amount of information contained in ensembles of increasing size, and we built these ensembles from starter cells, and then either built them uh, with cells that the, around the starter cell, so spatially constrained clusters of increasing size around the starter cell, or uh, increasing size ensembles that are randomly put together. And the prediction is that if information is clustered in some way, then uh, uh, ensembles built from spatially constrained um, uh, starter cells should differ in their uh, information content and, and should be different from, from randomly assembled uh, clusters of neurons, right? And so without going into detail, the, we, the, the data suggests that there is no spatial organization, no clustering such that uh, whether or not you built your ensembles from, from spatially constrained or random populations, uh, we don't find any statistical measure that, that, that can differentiate be between the, 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 the um, uh, efficiency of, or, or the, the accuracy of classification built from these different types of ensembles. Right? So now we use orders at, at uh, we use order paths that are that are very controlled so at very low uh, at, uh, very reproducible concentrations in in the environment in the wild and as Andreas and others have pointed out orders come in come in order plumes and one aspect of these order plumes is that the concentration of a of a given order and uh, at a certain point in time massively varies right and as linda has as has pointed out last time interactions of order and receptors 
and odorants very strongly depend on the concentration of odorants and, and as such information on neural activity that goes into the system uh, will vary wildly depending on, on, on these uh, fluctuations and concentrations within odor plumes. Now on the other hand, uh, perception of the identity of an odor, identity uh, perception of an order must remain stable in these order plumes, otherwise we'd constantly get confused as to what we're smelling. And so the prediction has been that, or, or one of the models has been that, that concentrate, that order representations in piriform cortex are concentration invariant, that, that they allow us to, to decode the identity of an order independent of concentration, right? So we tested that. Um, by, and, and this is just showing, in fact, that, that we can measure that with PID. So these are order, our order puffs, which, which most people use. If we take the PID a meter away and we open the window, then we get these massive fluctuations that, that Andrea, Andreas described in, in much more detail. So we tested um, how order representations in piriform, in particular how order coding, identity coding in piriform, depends on fluctuations in order concentration by using three orders at 10-fold and 100-fold uh, changing concentrations, so 10,000, 10, 1,000, and 1 in 100, and, and basically uh, going through the same sets of experiments. And what you see is that, that overall, the, the patterns of odor evoked activity don't massively change with increasing concentration. So we get a few more neurons that are active. We also get more neurons that are suppressed. If we um, look at tuning, at the specificity with which orders respond, we can use, it, we can use lifetime sparseness here as a, as a measure for, for that. And we see that while individual neurons uh, change their tuning, um, overall the distribution of tuning does, it, it remains stable across this 100-fold range in concentration. Is that a vapor concentration or a liquid? It's liquid dilution, but it's verified with PID measurements, so it, 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 it looks very, very reliable. Um, now, if we start looking at individual neurons, however, they do care about concentration, and they do care quite a bit. So if you look for it, so this is again one imaging site. This is now clustered just to, to uh, make it more visible. If we look at this cluster of neurons here, you see quite clearly that they are much more active in response to high concentrations of a set of neurons. Whereas this cluster on top here basically shuts down at high concentrations of hexanone. So individual neurons care about concentration. So how does that affect the, the encoding of, of order identity in piriform cortex? If you go back to simply calculating uh, correlations, then you see the following two things. So one is if, if we look at an individual order at last state, at increasing concentrations, the, the, the representations become more reliable and more similar. And that likely simply reflects the fact that, that there's, there's more signal over noise. So we're using higher concentrations, it's less noisy. More interesting, however, if you look across concentrations now for ethyl acid, you see that, they, that the, the, the response patterns gradually decorrelate. So they turn from orangey to blue, and they're about as blue as all the other ordinance I showed you before, um, which would suggest that as concentrations increase, the patterns become uh, very much um, indiscriminable amongst each other and, and, and very much you know, sort of uh, similar or, or as dissimilar as we observe for different ordinance. And that obviously poses a problem to the olfactory system in, 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 in its um, need to stably uh, encode or the identity. Second? So this looks exactly the same in the wake brain, in fact. So Kevin has done that in, in extracellular recordings. We've done a little bit, uh, but this looks very much the same. There, there are differences which I'll be happy to discuss. So, 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 so in order to, to solve or so, so to get at this problem, uh, we, we wanted to test the idea that order identity is not encoded in the entire ensemble, but that order identity independent on concentration may be, in fact, encoded in a sub-network or sub-populations of neurons. And so the question then becomes, do, can we isolate concentration invariant sub-populations of piriform neurons? And can these sub-populations uh, provide any advantage for the system to generalize, to, to identify an order across different concentrations, okay? And so we did that uh, using linear regression where we, where we first select neurons um, 
that are selective that that are uh, significantly modulated by the identity and intensity of an order, but we we eliminate norms with mixed uh, selectivity. That is a, where there's a interaction between identity and intensity, for simplicity at this point. Uh, and then we take norms that, that, that are significantly modulated by the order. So they care about which order they smell. And we ask whether within that population there's a subpopulation of norms which doesn't care at which concentration they smell this order, right? So, so the question is, do these norms exist? They're, they're about 12% of all uh, order responsive norms, about 30% of those that do care about uh, the identity of an order, and, and some example traces are shown here. And to verify this type of selection, we re-compute uh, the correlations. And what you see, uh, I think, quite clearly is that now with this, on, using this sub-network or sub-population of neurons, we generate fairly homogeneous correlations across now a hundredfold range in concentration. Okay? And so we can now go ahead and, and compare the, the coding properties of this sub-network with the entire uh, rest of the norms by, for example, uh, projecting these uh, patterns in PCA space and looking at its structure. And what you see is that while generic norms or all the other norms cluster primarily by concentration, so all the low concentration orders are here, independent of identity, concentration invariant networks now cluster uh, by the identity of an order, but within that cluster, they don't care about concentration. And we can ask more directly, uh, does this uh, subnetwork enhance the capability of the system to generalize, that is, to predict the identity of an order independent of its concentration? For that, we went back to, to a linear classifier. Now, these are a little bit difficult to read, but what we did is we trained the classifier on a set of orders and concentrations and then tested it with an order at a concentration that it was not trained with. So that's asking to identify an order at a concentration that it's never encountered before, which we think more accurately sort of reflects the, the challenges of the olfactory system in real life. And what you see is that for, for a tenfold range in concentration, so these are um, here, anyway, in yellow, for example, for this order, uh, the both generic norms and the concentration invariant subnetwork does reasonably okay with an accuracy of about 70%. But if you go to a more drastic change in concentration as a hundredfold, then you see that the subnetwork very um, significantly outperforms all the other norms in predicting the identity of the order. So, so yeah, so this is in fact a fairly complicated question because it's very much dependent on our data set. So we've done that by, so, so the, the criteria is that the norms care about which order, right? So that's the first selection criteria. And the second one is asking whether the concentration invariant. So if you expand or shrink the order set, then, then that, you know, ch changes the subpopulations we, 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 you generate by this procedure. I, I did, you know, how that relates to being able to discriminate between different sets of orders across different ranges of concentration in real life, I think, is, is difficult to predict. But, but within our data sets, these populations are fairly stable. Next slide. Okay. Well, two after. So, um, right. So, so I've said, uh, I've argued before that in, in order to represent the identity of an order, you have to integrate uh, segregated input channels from the olfactory bulb. And that may suggest that the way we, we observe order coding in piriform cortex is not uh, observed as such in olfactory bulb output in microencrafted cells, right? So we went back to a, a previously published data set in, in which we looked at microcells and, and did the same kinds of analyses uh, to see whether there's concentration invariant subnetworks already at the input level of, of olfactory cortex. And what you see is two things. So first of all, we see fewer uh, concentration invariant neurons in, in bulb than we see in piriform. 
but more relevant is, is, is what Winky just suggested, that when we do a shuffle control, that is we, we uh, randomize the cell identities to, as, a, as a reference for the numbers of concentration invariant neurons you would predict simply from the statistical distribution of the data set, then what we observe in the olfactory bulb is that the, the observed va value is sort of within that range of noise, whereas in piriform cortex it's, it's very significantly shifted to the right, suggesting that um, the, the, this segregation into concentration invariant neurons is something that, that is, if not generated, at least strongly enhanced in olfactory cortex with respect to its olfactory bulb inputs. So to summarize this set of experiments, I've shown you that, that the identity of orders is encoded in distributed ensembles of, of piriform neurons, that identity independent of intensity is encoded in subnetwork or in a subpopulation of piriform neurons, and that this concentration invariant subnetwork may be an emergent property of olfactory cortex and not as such observed in olfactory bulb. And I think more generally, um, moving forward, we would like to propose that distinct subpopulations of piriform neurons can be identified or encode different features of, it, of, of an olfactory stimulus that may be order identity, intensity, perhaps valence, and other things. So these experiments, um, like I said, highlight some of the, the functional uh, diversity of piriform neurons. In the second part of my talk, I'll, I'll uh, come to the molecular diversity of cell type a diversity in cell type identities we can now uh, assign to piriform neurons. And um, this work is very much based on, on, on a lot of uh, previous work and, and, and perhaps first uh, uh, defined by, by the Jessel lab in the spinal cord where, where they um, identified in particular transcription factors which define the identity of a neuron and its connectivity with downstream targets. So these are, again, motor neurons in the spinal cord. And, and, and as you can see here, that these this distinct types of motor neurons, which innervate different muscles in our limbs, can be delineated by their uh, distinct patterns of, of gene expression and, and often combinatorial uh, patterns of transcription factor genes. In the neocortex, uh, similar uh, experiments have been described by the, by, um, Maclis lab, Nina Sestan, Rubinstein lab, and others, uh, that, such that, that genes can identify or sort of uh, reflect basic neural circuit organization. For example, the lamina organization of the neocortex, so COX-1 is a marker for these superficial layer 2, 3 cells, while TLE4 is a marker for deep uh, layer 5, 6 cells in, in neocortex. And moreover, more recent experiments have shown that uh, again, combinations of transcription factors can not only tell you about the organization of neurons into, into, the, into the different lamina of, of neocortex, but also in, uh, tell you about their connectivity. So if you're a COX-1 neuron, uh, you, you're likely to project to the contralateral uh, in, in motor cortex. You're likely to project to contralateral motor cortex, whereas if you're a TLE4 neuron, you project to subcerebral uh, targets, including the thalamus and the corticospinal tract. So we figured that, that uh, having these uh, types of molecular markers that can identify the connectivity of different piriform neurons would be a big advantage to have in piriform. So what we did is we cut out the layers, we deep sequenced, and, and, and from these deep sequencing experiments, we identified candidate genes, which we tested by in situ and antibody staining. So these are just a few examples of genes that are selectively expressed in a particular layer. So for example, PRDM8. BDPD3 are exclusively expressed in layer two, not in one and three. So I should mention this is a initial stain, just as a reference for layer one, two, and three. And we find genes that are expressed are specific for sublayers. For example, FEDSF2 is here expressed in these superficial layer two cells, while MPCD, for example, is excluded from the superficial layer of layer two, but expressed in a subset of 2B and 3, et cetera. For some uh, of these um, antibodies, uh, for, for some of these genes with antibodies, so here are three more examples. Relin, as Charles Greer has pointed out, is fairly specific for excitatory neurons in layer 2A. It's also expressed in some interneurons in, in 1 and 3. COX-1 is, um, uh, is not present in this, is, uh, from this layer 2A, but is, is present in a large population of deep piriform neurons. 
and we have several markers that, that identify a layer specific subsets such as this one bar it's L1. So these are nice genes to identify types of neurons and look at the organization in layers. Doesn't tell us anything about connectivity yet. So in order to get there, we, we re-validated um, some of the, the piriform target areas by simply injecting an AAV channel YFP in piriform neurons. So channel YFP is very efficiently um, expressed in axon termini and then, then cut the brain from anterior to posterior. You see that piriform neurons project to the olfactory bulb. This is what, what Florian just uh, talked about in his previous talk, in the, in the previous talk. They project to, to many other cortical areas, and so we particularly looked at the medial prefrontal cortex, at the cortical amygdala, and at, at the antivinal cortex. And that is because they're far apart, and so we can now use retrograde tracing experiments to see how neurons projecting from piriform to these target areas are organized within piriform. And so that's such an experiment where we use colotoxin B as a retrograde tracer injected in bulk, prefrontal, amygdala, and entorhinal cortex. And what you see immediately, and I think what you can appreciate quite, quite readily, is that, that these neurons in piriform projecting to these different target areas now line up in different layers and not so different from the, from the layers of gene expression patterns I showed you before. So for example, bulk neurons are deep neurons, they're excluded from layer 2A. The frontal neurons are primarily present in 2B. In contrast, uh, cortical amygdala and entorhinal cortex are fairly excluded from deep layers, but present primarily in, in superficial layer 2, right? So in the following experiments, I'll, I'll, I'll try to convince you that the genes and connections match. Uh, we did that in in, in three different scenarios. So first we ask whether genes that specify different layers or cell types in different layers are the same, specify the same cell types that are segregated in terms of projection patterns. So in other words, are the Cox1 neurons in deep layers the same neurons that project to the bulb and are the real in uh, 2A neurons the same neurons that project to the cortical amygdala? And the, the short answer is yes. So about 80, 85% of all Cox neurons do project to the olfactory bulb, so they're co-labeled by retrograde tracer from the olfactory bulb with the COX-1 uh, transcription factor, and they never express relin. In contrast, all the relin, or 85% of the relin neurons, project to the cortical amygdala, and cortical amygdala con projecting neurons are never COX-1 positive. Okay, so neurons in different layers um, uh, match up well with transcription factor profiles that, that are layer specific. We can push this one step further by asking, or in fact, we can also uh, characterize these neurons morphologically by, by now sparsely label them with a retrograde transported virus. So we can inject the calf to pre with a conditional morphological marker in piriform. And we see that these COX1 positive ball projecting neurons are constituted by a fairly diverse set of pyramidal cells while the cortical amygdala projecting neurons are, are exclusively uh, these semilunar cells, which are characterized by the lack of, of basal dendrites, okay? So we can push this matching of genes and, and connections one step further, and we can ask whether neurons that, that uh, sit in the same territory but project to different target areas can be discriminated using uh, the genes we, we looked at. So that's, that's for example, the case uh, of bulb and prefrontal cortex projecting neurons, they, they largely overlap in this layer 2B of piriform cortex, right? So we can ask, can we find molecular signatures for neurons that sit or occupy overlapping territories but project to different target areas? And the answer is yes. So the combination of two transcription factors, Cox1 and C-tip, gives us a good prediction for, for the connectivity of patterns of these neurons. So this is the, the, the overall expression patterns. Cox1 is in deep layers in piriform. C-tip is primarily in these superficial cells, but they do overlap. If we zoom in to layer 2B, where these neurons sit, then we see cells that express either uh, C-tip alone in red, Cox1 alone in green, or Cox1 C-tip double positive cells, which are shown here in yellow. And if we combine these uh, molecular uh, markers with tracing studies, we find the following distribution. The bulk projecting neurons summarized in these pie charts are either COX1 positive alone in green or COX1 C-tip positive in yellow. There's very few C-tip only cells in red. 
In contrast, prefrontal neurons, again in the same uh, area within piriform, are either C-tip only or C-tip COX-1, but they're never green alone, so they're never COX-1 alone. And if we now inject two different color retrograde traces in, in prefrontal and olfactory bulb, we can identify neurons that project to both areas, so that they bifurcate and, and project to both target areas, and all of these neurons are both COX-1 and C-tip. So these, these experiments identify three types of neurons, COX-1 neurons that project to the bulb, C-tip neurons that project to prefrontal cortex, and COX-1 C-tip double positive neurons, which co-project to both target areas. So these data suggest that we have molecular markers that can identify the connectivity patterns of neurons that are either segregated in layers or overlapping uh, within a layer. And so the last experiment in this context we did is we asked whether these molecular signatures of connectivity hold in the absence of all layers if we scramble the organization of piriform cortex. And that's uh, an experiment that was done 50 years ago uh, by the characterization of these Wheeler mutant mice, which have uh, massive uh, defects in the lamination of neocortex. We see similar defects in the lamination of, of piriform. So you see that in the density of the neurons, you, you cannot detect any lamination based on, on, on the density of neurons. Wheeler expression is lost through to the, the mutation of the, the real and locus. However, all the other genes that we've looked at in terms of layer-specific markers remain to be expressed at numbers that are fairly similar to control, only that they are now distributed throughout the piriform cortex. So for example, COX-1, which is a marker for deep cells, is now found without any bias across the entire depth of piriform. So we can ask, are connections maintained? In the first place, we focused on piriform connections to bulb and the cortical amygdala. That's because these structures are reasonably well maintained in the real mutant mouse. And we see that piriform neurons do project to the bulb and to the cortical amygdala at numbers that are fairly similar to controls, only again that we lose the lamina segregation. And finally, we can ask whether the markers we identify as uh, delineating the connectivity patterns of these neurons are maintained in, these, in, in this scenario? And, and the answer is yes. So despite the fact that COX-1 neurons are now positioned without preference across the depth of piriform, 85% of COX-1 neurons do project to the ball very similar to what we see in controls. And the, the, the real in cells, so we cannot use real in as a marker for these superficial cells, but we can use FETF2, which, which overlaps with real in in these semilunar cells. And despite the fact that they are distributed or scrambled throughout piriform depth, all of these, or 85% of these cells, still maintain their specific connections with the cortical amygdala. So to summarize this set of data, We've identified using this uh, laser capture deep sequencing approach, we've identified genes that delineate distinct piriform layers and cell types. Um, these genes, either alone or in combination, can tell us about the specific specificity of, of piriform projection patterns and connectivity. And this link between the molecular identity of neurons and their connectivity is maintained in the scrambled cortex of a real mutant animal, which suggests or which sort of highlights the importance of intrinsic genetic programs in specifying connectivity rather than sort of local um, spatial information. Yes. Uh, thank you for the Yes, so I think by and large, that's what we're doing now. We're not specifically looking at, at, at this set of neurons, but you know, the, the hypothesis is that different types of neurons do different things. And, and, and so the, the goal is to match up identity and connectivity with the functional properties of, of these neurons. And we don't have a lot of data yet, but that's where, that's where we're going. Right. So, in fact, maybe I can ask that in in a minute. It will come to that. 
Right. So the problem there is that these transcription factors tend to be expressed along the entire pathway, so starting in the sensory neuron and the bulb and different subsets of bulb neurons. I think we'd have to aim at conditional knockouts in piriform, which is a hard thing to do. Um, Right, so we use viruses a lot. It's yes, so it's a large area to manipulate with a virus. So we we're both. So we have from this deep sequencing data, we have some candidate genes that that for promoters that appear from specific, and we are trying to generate pre lines to see if they'll be useful for that purpose. We don't have any yet. We're hoping that other people generate them. Uh, we, but I'll come back, in fact, I'll, I'll go to the next slide in terms of sort of understanding the, the genetics of the system a little better. Um, so, so, so quickly, uh, future or sort of ongoing experiments and future perspectives. And the first thing I really would like to point out is sort of striking uh, observations we made when we looked at gene expression patterns in piriform. And, you know, each time you look, you obviously have the neocortex and the hippocampus side by side. And, and the prediction could have been that piriform is a simple paleocortex, only contains three layers and maybe a fewer genes or fewer genetically defined cell types in piriform than you have in, in the six-layered neocortex. Now that, uh, at least for us, is, is very obviously not the case. Every single gene that people have looked at in neocortex is a gene that defines the identities and, and, and connectivity of, of neocortical neurons is expressed in piriform cortex. However, the basic organization of these genes is very, very different. And so that's illustrated here in this slide. So while Cux1 is a marker for superficial neurons, it's clearly a marker for deep neurons in piriform. And while CTIP is a marker for deep neurons in, in neocortex, it's clearly a marker for superficial neurons in piriform. This is not uh, always the case. We get all kinds of combinations. It makes no sense to us. What is also striking is that the genes that are never co-expressed in neocortex are very happily co-expressed in piriform. And, and this is important because uh, people have postulated that sort of cross-repressive uh, networks specify by these neurons in neocortex, and, and clearly the situation is very different in the piriform cortex. So, so however, one, uh, you know, the, this apparent inversion of gene expression patterns, the, these layers reflect the sequential generation of neurons during development, and and uh, and and the the observation that some of these genes are somewhat upside down in piriform suggested to us the, the idea that piriform may develop in a very different way. And, and so we did, a, we did an experiment that is identical to what, what Charlie described in the first day of the meeting. We, yes? We, we don't. In fact, yeah, so in fact, that's a good, so in fact, we do now. So in sections, this is very painful because everything you want to look at ends up not being on your section. So we're doing everything in cleared brains now where we, you know, particular, any sort of transition area is a bit puzzling to us. How, how do you, you know, make things uh, uh, connect from, from one area to another in terms of gene expression patterns? Um, so, so we did EDU birth dating experiments and, and, and what we see is what, what Charlie presented is that in contrast to neocortex, at least piriform layer two develops uh, outside in as opposed to inside out. So in neocortex, the early born neurons inhabit, inhabit the deep layers. In piriform, you see that the early born neurons here uh, indicated by EDU labeling at 11.5 are the superficial cells uh, quantified here, whereas the later born neurons in the 14.5 are clearly excluded from the more superficial layers and, and are, are predominantly present in the deep layers. So, so in summary, despite the fact that we have the same, if not the same, largely overlapping sets of genes that specify these neurons in, in piriform and neocortex, the logic of circuit assembly appears to be fairly different. And so what we're doing now is, is we're using the, the FEDSF2 gene as an entry point in, in, in studying that. So FEDSF2 is a, is a key determinant of of deep layer cells in the neocortex as, as primarily uh, shown by Nena Sistan's lab. So it, it, it's, it's essential for the specification of, of corticospinal tract neurons, which 
which also has big implications for mammalian evolution, etc. Um, in contrast, we see FEDs have two very robustly expressed in these superficial piriform neurons that are very different in terms of their morpholo morphological characteristic, intrinsic properties, connectivity, etc. So, so what we're doing is we're following now uh, using transcriptomics and, and, and enhancer um, accessibility studies, the specification of these uh, FEDs of two lineages to try and sort of identify key decision points in the, in, the, in the specification of different cortical neural cell types that, that may also determine their connectivity and intrinsic properties. And I think it will be important to sort of understand how um, uh, basic neural circuit motifs are specified genetically. What, it also, what we also hope to generate by, by doing these experiments is more specific uh, markers for piriform neurons, and, and that's sort of in response to Linda's a question before that, that, that will allow us to target these cells in a more refined way. Okay. So the other sets of experiments we're currently doing is, is bringing together, and that's what, what Pierre-Marie uh, pointed out, the genetic and, and imaging and, and behavioral tools eventually, uh, with the idea in mind that different types of neurons do different things. It's, it's somewhat trivial, but, but uh, it's not a very prominent um, concept or hasn't been a very prominent concept in the field. So we can target these different types of neurons now using mouse genetics. We can use imaging to assess their functional properties and optogenetics and chemogenetics to manipulate uh, their activity. We are also particularly interested in, in how information is being transmitted throughout the, the, the nervous system. And then that, that's again very similar to what, what Florian discussed with the idea in mind that, that different features of information are not uh, transmitted uh, randomly throughout the entire cortex and that they, they may be used in differential ways uh, depending on the behavioral context. And we can target, so we can do that by targeting uh, neurons based on their connectivity patterns using retrogradely transported viruses. And finally, we can do that in awake behaving animals. So this takes a lot of weight off my shoulders. By either, by using green lens technology, both in, in these miniscope uh, types of experiments, but also in two photon uh, head fixed experiments. And, and so the idea is to, to understand how different types of neurons, how circuit functions, as I, as I pointed out in the introduction, emerge from the concerted activity of different types of neurons, and how information about the stimulus, about order identity, intensity, valence, et cetera, is being routed throughout the nervous system in a, in a behaviorally dependent or behavioral context dependent manner. And with this, I'll, I'll stop and I'll acknowledge the people. So the, the genetic work was done by Asunto Diodato, who was in fact a student here at CISA before she joined my lab. Imaging experiments were done by Benjamin Roland in my lab. And a lot of the, the this was done in, in close collaboration with Kevin Franks at Duke, who has done Electro extracellular recordings and, and come to uh, somewhat uh, similar yet complementary conclusions. Uh, we got a lot of help from Brisbane TV in terms of data analysis, Andreas Schaefer, uh, Gloria Choi, and Sonia Garel for the molecular studies. And this is our funding. And thank you very much for your attention.